I'm following the model of Acts 17. Paul declared to them that the one and true living God who made them was calling them uh, to repent. Romans chapter 1, the wrath of God's revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth by means of unrighteousness. Romans 1 says they know God exists, but they suppress the truth and, and righteousness. The Muslim faith is based on the Quran. The Quran itself endorses the law of Moses, the Psalms of David, and the Gospel of Jesus. The Quran affirms the revelation of Moses and the Gospels and that Jesus was a prophet. You go to the Quran and show that the Quran endorses the Bible, then you go to the Bible and show that what the Quran says contradicts the Bible. You see, the Quran contradicts the Bible. So then on the Quran's own terms, you must reject the Quran. You see, if the Quran is true, then the Quran is false. They conflict, first of all, in that according to the Quran, God cannot have a son. But according to the Gospel of Jesus, God did have a son, and his name is Jesus. The Quran explicitly teaches that God has no son. The New Testament is explicit that Jesus is the one and only unique Son of God. And no one can be right with God without blood sacrifice. There's no blood sacrifice in the Quran. In Islam, there is no shedding of blood for the redemption of sin. And yet, this is stated in the Old Testament. Because you know, if the Bhagavad Gita is correct in what it says, there is no difference between it and the Bible. Oh, and by the way, not to, man, not to overlook the obvious, there's no difference between you and the Bhagavad Gita either. There's no difference between you and the book and the earth and the sky and the trees and everything. We're all in this thing together. Oh no, it's a huge mistake to think the Bhagavad Gita is running in the same race with the Bible. The Bhagavad Gita undermines all logic and reasoning. When it comes to Hinduism, Hinduism, all is God, so contradictions are valid within Hinduism. All is one. Right? So Hinduism goes out the window if you're going to hold to the principle of non-contradiction. First of all, you'll be looking for prejudicial conjectures. You're offering up prejudicial conjecture. That means that you will not be neutral. You will not be taking an open-minded approach. There is no neutrality. There is no position of neutrality. If naturalism is true, I can say two things for sure. First, there are no absolutes. Is it your position, given your worldview, that absolutes exist? There are no absolute prescriptions. There's only descriptions. The laws of physics are prescriptive rather than descriptive. If naturalism is true, that is that all that exists is the natural order, and there isn't anything that goes beyond man's experience in time. If naturalism is true, then the naturalist has no reason to believe his naturalism. So, so you see, if you affirm materialism, then you can't affirm materialism. You see, I don't, the atheist is just a bundle of contradictions. He can't bring his worldview into harmony with itself. You're a walking contradiction. On a naturalistic principle, there is no right or wrong. There's just might. There's just what happens. You can't find obligatory authority anywhere in the world if it's just matter in motion. Where does ought come from in a, in a uh, skeptic worldview? Don't you have, don't you just have molecules in motion? You can talk to people about the uniformity of nature, which is to say the very possibility of doing science. Science has to assume the uniformity of nature. No matter what they say about the past, eventually you're going to point out is logically irrelevant to what's in the future. Just because we have observed consistencies in the past without observing inconsistencies does not logically necessitate that those consistencies will continue into the future. You don't need reasons for the uniformity of nature, you say, but then everything else calls for reasoning. So you're not even living in terms of your own world. Your criterion in order to believe in something that it should have evidence. What is your evidence for the uniformity of nature? Your, your entire worldview, you are believing things for which you have no evidence for. You're being inconsistent. You can't appeal to experience to prove the uniformity of nature. You can't perceive the uniformity of nature. You assumed that memory was reliable. You assumed you could trust your senses. 
just assumptions like that your sense perception is reliable, your basic memory is reliable. You need to realize that every system of thought has a starting point which verifies itself. And that's not the sort of thing you're going to hear at the university. People don't like to admit that. But it's inescapable. Every system of thought has what we call a self-attesting authority for itself. All ultimate sources of authority would rest upon self-authentication. If it's an ultimate standard, it is going to have to authorize itself. Any ultimate justifier would have to be self-attesting, self-authenticating. God doesn't lie. He is true to himself. God is logical. God cannot lie. God is logical. What we are doing here is challenging the unbeliever to provide what are called the preconditions of intelligibility. The Christian worldview provides the necessary preconditions for intelligibility. The proof of the Christian world is that without it, you couldn't prove anything. Because without the Christian God actually existing, then there can be no evidence for anything. Why do we expect toothpaste to spurt from the tube when we squeeze it? We might call this the toothpaste proof of God's existence, okay? If you say that the toothpaste will come out tomorrow, on what basis do you make that claim? We support that expectation in terms of two things. One, our past experience with toothpaste tubes, and two, the belief that nature is uniform. You believe in the uniformity of nature. That the future is like the past. That the future will be like the past.